Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of Second Take Cinema, coming at you from the glorious Impala Films headquarters in sunny Southend-on-Sea. As always, I am your host, Jamie Evans, joined, as always, by my co-host, Rory Jocelyn. Hello, everybody. And today, we're getting in our time machine, and we're travelling back, baby, all the way to before colour was invented. We're travelling back to 1950. For a French movie that literally until the moment it started, I thought was an American movie. Um, and then. <laughs> well, it has Americans in it. Yeah. And then when it started, I was like, oh, it's not. <laughs> it is French. Um, today, we are talking about the wages of fear. So sit back, relax, crank your headphones up, and let's give a second take to the wages of fear. <laughs> So, we're talking about the 1953 French thriller film The Wages of Fear, or attempted in the French, La Salaire de la Pure, which literally translates to The Salary of Fear. Uh, It's actually based on a 1950 French novel by Georges Arnaud, or Arnaud, I don't know how that's pronounced, directed by... Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. (laughs) Directed by (laughs) Henri Georges Clouseau, starring Yves... Yves Montand? Yves. Yves Montand? Yeah. Yves Montand. Oh, it's like Yves Saint Laurent. Yeah, Yves, um, Yves Montand. Yves Montand. Charles Vanel, Folco Luli, and Peter Van Eyck. Uh, Eyck? Eyck. Uh, this was a co production between France and Italy. Yeah. Uh, and released in 1953. As I said, it doesn't have, because of how old it is, there is no information on the budget or how much it actually earned. Rather, and this is the only time I've ever seen box office figures given this way, box office, 6,944,306 admissions. Right, so maybe it was before they took the revenue, they instead took the actual number of seats. Yeah. Interesting. Um, but Six yeah. million people ain't bad for 1953. No, for a French film as well. Yeah, which, uh, by the way, was banned in America. Well, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna argue you on that because yeah. according to this, it wasn't banned; it was heavily cut. Right. So it did get a release, but uh, I think it was a full half hour. Was there was removed. a lot of different cuts of this film, which made when my dad tried to find it on DVD, made it near enough impossible. We bought three full copies of The Wages of Fear, each one butchered in a different and unique way. Excellent, excellent. Um, and the only reason that we've got a fully like fully watchable copy now is a uh, criterion collection brought it out on i think they did the dvd initially but then mm. then on blu-ray which is the version we watched oh la di da well you know we got to watch it all in hd so taking a look at how this film was received it was an instant critical hit upon its original release yeah. bosley crowther of the new york times said the excitement derives entirely from the awareness of nitroglycerin and the gingerly breathless handling of it you sit there waiting for the theater to explode it was a hit with the public and and in France, it was the fourth highest earning film that year. Nice. In 1982, Pauline Kael called it an existential thriller, the most original and shocking French melodrama of the 50s. When you can be blown up at any moment, only a fool believes that character determines fate. If this isn't a parable of man's position in the modern world, it's at least an illustration of it. The violence is used to force a vision of human existence. And in 1992, our good friend Roger Ebert stated, the film's extended suspense sequences deserve a place among the great stretches of cinema yeah um i'm just looking to see if there is any 
Um, it doesn't look like there's any counterpoints to that. Uh, the last thing to note, really, was, yes, uh, for the US release, it lost 35 minutes worth of footage, yep. largely focusing on what was deemed anti-Americanism. So that would be most of the stuff from the beginning, because obviously stuff on the road isn't really anti-American, but the stuff yeah. certainly at the beginning would have been. And British-American filmmaker Christopher Nolan says he was strongly influenced by The Wages of Fear when directing his movie Dunkirk. I haven't seen Dunkirk, so I, I can neither Dunkirk. comment. I heard it was kind of crap. Yeah, I. But from what I've seen of Dunkirk, there's a lot of aeroplanes. I mean, Harry Harry Styles is in it, so yeah, uh, can't be that good. That's an immediate turn off. Apparently, according to some people that have watched it, because to be fair, I'm being a bit harsh there. I've never never even seen the film and haven't seen Harry Styles act. He might be brilliant. Uh, They've said he was very good in the role that he was doing. Oh yeah, apparently only has like three lines. Right. Well. All right. but either way, apparently he was very good. I don't know. Maybe we're just being biased because we're like, it's a fucking singer. But and not a good one. Well, I'm not going to slag off his singing because I'm not a very good judge of singers because uh, I'm not a vocalist. I'm, I'm not a, something of a vocalist myself. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but yeah, either way, it's, uh, it, 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 it does pull away a little bit. Though some singers do make it like... Whoopi oh, some Goldberg some done good. well be- doing films. Was Whoopi Goldberg a singer? She was in a nun singing film. <laughs> this episode is now cancelled. <laughs> That's your punishment for making jokes like that. Oh. So this film was chosen by yourself, Rory. You entered yes. this one into the episode list. Uh, tell us a bit about your first experience with Wages of Fear and why you wanted to give it a second take. So my father showed me Wages of Fear. Obviously spoke a little bit about attempting to find a complete copy on DVD, but my dad did record a complete, uh, I'm guessing a complete copy off the TV on VHS way back when. Um, and it's, I, I love this film. It's incredibly thrilling. It was very, uh, the, the way it builds tension always gripped me. Uh, and it's a film that most modern filmmakers that I know of in this local area, I'm sure there's, this is only a microcosm, not a, a generalisation of filmmakers currently at all. But certainly within this area, whenever I mention Wages of Fear, very few, at least certainly around my age, have know what I'm talking about. You know, uh, and very even fewer know about the, the remake of it in the 70s, Sorcerer, which we are, I think, going to cover at some point on STC, so yeah. I won't go too much into Sorcerer here. Um, but yeah, the Wages of Fear... It, it, the way it gripped me and but that i think the other thing with wages of fear was it was one of those first times where i'd seen a film really loved the film but saw the flaws and saw things in it where i was like you know what i l- like i'd love to be able to uh if i w- if i had the option of remaking it say there's things I would do differently, which I think would increase the story or increase the t- the speed of the, t- the the pacing of the film. Mm. We'll get to the pacing stuff like that later. Um, but the film is two and a half hours long for what is essentially a, a drive on the road movie. Um, so trimming that down would be something I would do. And I started looking at it and piecing together what I loved, piecing together the things that I didn't love quite so much why I loved certain bits, and I loved the character development of the character Joe, which again we'll get to when we start talking about the film proper. So all of those things were a big influence on me. So when we started doing STC, one of the first films, I, actually a film I've been wanting to show you for a long time was Wages of Fear. Um, since the first time I mentioned it though, it's come to like that, you're not really into road movies, uh, or very butch macho movies, uh, certainly not butch macho road movies. <laughs> so... I'm kind of curious as to where Wages of Fear strikes you. I don't think you can call anything French macho. Well, it's got Yves Montand. Um, and he plays a man called Mario, and there's another guy called, called Luigi. Luigi. Uh, and so, they kiss. Mm. So macho. So I had never seen Wages of Fear before. I'd heard the title, uh, but other than that, all I knew about it was what you had told me. Um, so this movie... I didn't hate. I don't think I'll ever watch it again. Um, it is entirely too long. Mm-hmm. Um, it is an hour and one minute before they get in the fucking trucks. Yeah, so essentially that's the start of Act 2. A full 40 minutes can be cut from that beginning. Yeah. Because 
there was so much in that beginning that wasn't relevant information. Now, this is entirely a uh, personal choice because I know there's a big discourse going on at the minute between some directors saying, you know, it's okay for f- films don't need a reason to be long. They can be as long as they want. Yeah, and this is two uh, and a half hours. Yeah, um, David Lynch is a big one and so is James Cameron for... It's my film. It can be as long as I fucking want it to be. I don't have to justify why it's long, etc., etc., etc. And that's fine if you agree with that. Personally, I don't. Mm. Because personally, I'm a busy fucking person with a life to live. Don't don't make your film that long if it's not relevant I think, to yeah, me, personally. Yeah. I think the uh, a, a big caveat on that, actually, is you kind of can get away with going, it's my fucking movie, it'll be as long as I want it to be. If you're James Cameron, yeah. people will sit down. I, I, I was talking to my parents about this, actually, um, in a previous discussion. It was, if you're a new filmmaker like you and I, we're basically nobody in yeah. terms of, like, you know, no one's going to go, oh, Rory Jossin, Steven Spielberg, yeah. you know, the same. You haven't you know. earned any goodwill yet. Yeah, so if I come out with a movie that's mm. three hours long, yeah. people are going to be like, oh, I don't know the guy, I don't know the brand. So, like, say I don't yeah. have a, you know, a franchise behind it. Uh, and here's Mr. Nobody with his nothing, nobody knows film. It's three hours. Enjoy. People go, you know what? I ain't got the time for that, mate. But you go, extended edition of Lord of the Rings. Mm. Just one of them is like four hours. Yeah. No. Each one. You can keep it. But you the thing is, most it. people will say, yes, I'll watch yeah, it. Because no. they know the brand. They know the director. Yeah. So, but, but it's, that's what I mean. Yeah. People did this with Avatar as well. They will give things a free pass based on the brand name of the director and yeah. the franchise, if it's known. Speaking of... But like, as a new director, yeah. you cannot get away with no. that shit. And speaking of brand recognition, things like that, we actually, me and Benton had this discussion on my old show, Jamie Hill Film Taste Sucks. Uh, do you remember there was a whole big kerfuffle a couple of years ago where they finally, where a bunch of fans pressured Warner Brothers into releasing the Snyder Cut of Justice League. Yes. It's four hours long. Uh. Right? And as I said, on, I don't and I start an hour and a half long. Thing is, I stand by that. this. I stand by this. My personal opinion. I know some DC fans disagree, and that's fine. Because Benton turns me went, but you were fine with Avengers Endgame being. Th- I think that's three hours long, maybe yeah. three and a half. And I said, yeah. Here's the difference. Avengers Endgame is the final film in a three phase saga. It's like the twenty fifth film in a twenty fifth five film story sure. arc. They have earned the right to be that long. This is the first Justice League film out of what was supposed to be four, I think Zack Snyder said. Are you telling me they're only going to get longer from here? Yeah, or stay the same length, but then that's four by four. But the reason it was so long when you watch it is because DC didn't want to... Because they've tried to leapfrog Marvel, whereas Marvel had done all the solo films to set up the universe. So Avengers 1, I think, is a nice tight two hours, I think. Yeah. Um... Because they were trying to rush it all, ju- the Snyder Cut they has to, to be everyone. four hours long. Yeah. But anyway, um, and another quick thing about James Cameron. Do you remember we commented on an episode earlier in this show that surprisingly Alita Battle Angel is getting a sequel, mainly because he did Avatar 2 and, and can do what he wants? Success, yeah. So it turns out there's a caveat to that. The studio have told him he has to direct it. Robert Rodriguez is out. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, they will only green. As if Robert Rodriguez doesn't pull in money. Jeez. Not not like James Cameron well, that's does, true. does he? He hasn't got the same. Uh, unfortunately, cachet, but... Rodriguez's newest film bombed. Hypnotic, right. the which actually looks quite good. I actually want to see Hypnotic. Mm. Um, it's uh, it's an action thriller, which I'm not usually into, but it's got like a little twist to it. Um, nice. So I kind of want to see it. But yeah. Anyway, okay. so, so back to the wages of fear. Yeah. Um, so the, the timing was an issue for me. The other thing for me, which I didn't, again, didn't hate, um, cause I, I didn't hate this film. Um, and this might be a problem with overselling because this is, I mean, this is a film you love. Like you've yeah. been going on about this for like two years to me now. Well, it's, the, it's one of the, the best films for uh, how it builds and releases tension. Mm. So this is where I disagree. Okay. <laughs> cause don't wrong. There are some very good sequences in it. Mm. But I was sat there going, oh, I'm about to see an absolute masterclass in suspense and tension, etc., etc. Nothing, and, and I'm going to be fair here, I'm not going to compare modern films to this one. I'm going to compare films from around the time. Okay. 
this doesn't come close to the suspense of pretty much anything Alfred Hitchcock ever made for me. Okay. Um, Rebecca, which I think is from 45, I think. Psycho is 1960. Mm. Strangers on a Train, I think, is the closest to this one. Probably in that, I, yeah, I yeah. think that's I think that's around 53, Strangers on a Train. I can't um, remember. I think it's very close, if not actually 53. Yeah, which we are going to cover Strangers on a Train later yeah. in this show. I haven't seen that one myself. So um, that, I think that, that, that's our culture exchange yeah, of that year, I think. I, I think there are some similarities to sure. it um including a villain who is kind of soft coded to be read as gay. possibly being gay yeah. um or even to like not even include hitchcock something like the original night of the living dead has got this wonderfully tense sequence in it mm. where they've they've got a truck to escape the zombies but there's no gas in it but there is a petrol pump and all they've got to do is get the truck to the petrol pump to fill up, but there's zombies everywhere. Right. Um, and that's a really well done sequence where you're like, oh no, are they going to get caught? Whatever. Um, this had really tense sequences in it. Unfortunately for me, the the biggest tense moment actually comes, like the, the bit that sort of made me sit up and be like, oh, actually comes when they're very first getting in the truck when the guy is carrying the jerry can and oh, he slips stacks it, yeah um I, that i had a moment of like oh oh yeah um the rest of it was kind of it wasn't bad tension um but it i don't know how to explain it for some reason it just wasn't i think maybe because i wasn't connecting to the characters as well yeah so the characterization i thought the the actors did a good job with the characters they were given I think the problem was... Shall we get into the film proper then? Because yeah. that, that allows me to explain it. So the first part of this film, which as I say, Act 1 is an hour and two minutes long, which is way too long for an Act 1. Um, the There's a lot of really good stuff in Act 1, and it sets up a lot of stuff, but a, you get the girlfriend of Mario, or Yves Montand, yeah. uh, which is a fine setup, but it goes on for far too long. Also, it goes nowhere. I thought, did we need her? Was she relevant See, at all? It, the way I would change the ending would have made that more relevant. But mm. the, uh, as we'll get to, the ending of this film is something that I would change as well. Um, but I would shorten this beginning sequence. Some of the information we get about the drivers we follow, we can get later when they're in the cabs once we're already on the journey. Yeah. Um, I don't think we... Uh, the other thing I don't think we needed was the uh, training section. Yeah, you don't so need any of that. When they go, we need to call in for drivers, they could have then just picked their drivers yeah. and let them go. Instead, there's a sequence of them training and like trying to fuck Screw up the other drivers. Up. And there was a guy who ends up committing suicide. That was irrelevant. Yeah, um, it's a really good reveal, though. It is a good I reveal. I do like that shot. But I, I think that could have been... All of that stuff could be condensed yeah. and some of that information taken out of that part and placed into the cabs... So we can get a bit more story and a bit more personal discovery yeah. of each driver as they're talking and going on their journey. Do we ever find out what happens to the German guy who gets the job and then he leaves? The, the, so, the last time he's seen is with Joe. So we're yeah. led to believe. I thought. So I watched. When I watched it this time, I've never noticed this before. That guy's right at the ending dancing. I thought he was, but it's not him. Is it not? Is he wearing no. the same shirt? Because I. He's, he's got a hat on at first, and then he yeah. takes the hat off. I was looking, going, oh, I bet that's him. I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it was a different guy. Because I think the suggestion is... is Because I thought the suggestion was Joe had killed him. Yeah, I think until that is it, the suggestion that you're meant to go yeah, with. But then it turns out... He may have just bottled it. Well, yeah, because I thought Joe... Because obviously, I hadn't seen this before. You knew where it was going. Of course. I didn't know it was going to turn out that Joe is basically full of shit. He's a giant pansy. Yeah. Everything um, he does is all... He's all pomp and, uh, you know, it's, it's all just a circus of him. Yeah. He comes in, he, it's all, he, you know, aren't I the wealthy guy? He's got a very nice linen suit. He's got the feather thing to fan himself down. Mm. And he, but immediately he gets out of the taxi. The guy goes, it's a dollar. He's like, yeah, yeah, hang on, I might still go somewhere. And then he confesses tomorrow. He's got no cash. Right. And from that point on, everything he's doing is like, I'm the hard guy, you know. It's, it's almost like he's yeah. a mafia guy. Well, because we've seen him with a gun 
before the old guy disappears. Yeah. So I thought what they were going to go with was that he was like this loose cannon, slightly evil character. Yeah. And that he would like halfway through try and either like divert them to go do something else or something mm. like that. But it actually just turns out he's a wimp. Yeah. Yeah. He's an absolute coward. Um, and you find that out. Sl- well, I say slowly, but quite quickly, actually, over the course of it. He first starts off going, I might have malaria. And it's like, mate, you don't just have a touch of it, malaria. It feel. I have to admit, it, something I would want changed is that feels like it comes on too quickly. Yeah, I think it, it, you're right. It would be better if the reveal of Joe's cowardice comes along a, a little bit more gradually. Mm. Um, you're Because it's almost the minute he gets into the cab to actually drive, he turns into a coward. Yeah, you um, need some like... like what you need is for them to hit a perilous situation earlier on either that or get them to the the rocky road earlier the one where they have to travel at over 40 yeah, or under so six e- either the and rocky then that road shakes him either the rocky road or the um or the bit with or move the bit with the bridge yeah. earlier and what you need at first is to subtly have him just be like he never does anything he sort of orders everyone else around whilst he stays safe yeah and you think that's because he's an asshole. Yeah, like he's the boss almost. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's assuming a position of power. Which, to be honest, I am kind of making this like Night of the Living Dead now. When they get to the house in Night of the Living Dead, there's a guy called Harry who's like, there's a family hiding in this house and our two survivors, Ben and uh, Barbara, get there. And he's kind of taking control and ordering everyone around. And you, you come to realize it's because he's a complete coward. Right. Because he doesn't want to do anything well, proactive. Uh, when they want to go and fill up the truck, he's like, no, no, no. He doesn't even want to board up the windows of the house. He wants them all to go into the basement and lock the door. Which, as Ben points out, well, that's your last resort. Because if we go there now and the zombies get through that door, there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. Um. And he just is like, I know what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. I thought we were going for something more like that. Yeah, it did start off that way, but then it, he, he very quickly degenerates into the, the, the big coward of the story. Mm. Um, so let's talk about set pieces. So the, the opening, the first act, let's talk about the first act a little bit more. We set up. <laughs> Can we talk about the fact that, that, that late, uh, the actress, I don't know her name, unfortunately, but the, the actress who plays. <laughs> The actress who plays the girlfriend to Mario. Yeah. Yeah. Um, clearly doesn't. She clearly doesn't know how to wash a floor. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure what that's about because at the you see her washing the floor, fine, but the amount of water it's almost like you know when you get out of a swimming pool mm. and there's the walkway to the showers and it's always yeah. like for some reason overly boggy with water. Yeah. It's that. Yeah. This is not like she's mopping the floor. No. And what's and, she's got a sponge. She's soaking it up and then wringing it out on, on the, the floor. floor. Yeah. Because I, I must admit, I, that bit started and I thought something weird was going on because I thought we might be watching some weird sort of BDSM film well, because she crawls over to him like a rub- dog yeah. and he's like rubbing her head up against him yeah. and he's stroking her like a dog. Yeah, I thought that was weird. I forgot about that bit. And I was like, oh, this might actually interest me. <laughs> <laughs> you sordid individual. Uh, I, I think that is explained a little bit, though not fully, by the fact that the owner then pervs over her and tells her to go to his room. And he, he mentioned specifically that basically he keeps around not because she's good at scrubbing the floor, but because she looks good scrubbing the floor. Because he's banging her. Yeah, and like it, it, he turns around and sees her money shot of her ass, and he's like... Mm. Uh, so we know that guy's... Bit, and he tries to whip her as well, which is his obviously in, in his jam. So there was a little bit of BDSM suggestion, mm. not obviously shown. Um but yeah, th- we get a little bit of, uh, it seems that, so let's talk about Mario. Mario is uh, kind of, he's, he first appears to be sort of your good guy, good looking hero character. Um, he's friendly with the other tramps. Mm. And they are, even though they're called tramps, they don't look like, you know, hobos. No. They, and- they, it's just that they're people from all sorts of different walks of life that have wound up in this shithole and have no way to get yeah out. i don't think there was ever really an explanation for how they've all ended up in south america is there well if there's so two of them at least uh come from germany 
Uh, one of which is the German gay truck driver who escaped from mm-hmm. uh, the salt mines that the Nazis put him in. Yeah. There's another German guy. I was who waiting was... for Nazis to turn up. I was waiting yeah. for it to be. I was waiting for it to be revealed that one of them like was a former Nazi. Well, I think who'd suggest- fled. I think it's suggested that the truck driver who gets replaced with Joe because he doesn't mm. turn up. I think it's suggested that he might be a Nazi. Right. But there's the English guy who they call the Doctor. There's, uh, but yeah, there's uh, Luigi, who's obviously Italian. Mm-hmm. There's Mario, who's French, even though he's got the name Mario. It sounds weird nowadays. Uh, oh no, he says he comes from. Uh, he he worked in Paris, but he came from somewhere with beginning with C. That's cl- in Carabas or something. Yeah, like something that. like that. Which is like I'm guessing the very southern part of France, maybe bordering on Italy. I don't know. Um, it might be a border I don't state. Think- I don't think France borders Italy, mate. Oh, I don't know geography very I well. I think France borders Spain to the south and France Germany. Where does France border Argentina? I'm joking. I'm going to say, please yes. tell me you know you're joking. <laughs> 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 anyway. I'll tell you where Britain borders the Argentina. It does indeed. Uh, that's the Falklands Islands. Yeah, and thankfully there is no political issue with that whatsoever. No. <laughs> no, that's a completely clear problem. Uh, so... Mario has this girlfriend that, clearly because she's the only white person, there's a lot of racism at the beginning of this film as well. Yeah. Not heavy racism, there's no N-words or anything like that being thrown around. No, but, but they do describe a black character as having lived in a coconut tree. Yes, uh, they call the locals who are usually darker skinned, often black, savages. There is uh, So there is quite a bit of that sort of dialogue from our quote-unquote heroes, but... Those are actually more from Joe and Mario. Mm. Mario ends up really, I think, becoming an anti-hero rather than a hero. Oh, 100%. Um, Joe turns out to be more of, like, he starts off, he looks like he's going to be, you know, your big uh, villain. Mm. But he ends up turning out to be, an, I'm guessing, an anti-villain, really, because he becomes so heavily bullied by Mario by the end of the yeah. film. Um, yeah, their roles definitely reverse. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting looking at it from the lens of society today. Yeah. Because back in the 50s, I think there'd be a lot less sympathy for Joe because it was still that very yeah, masculine centric society. It's very much suggested that he's a jealous gay man mm. because Where... he tries, he pulls Mario away from his girlfriend and then he basically throws tissy fits if. Mario, if Mario's girlfriend wants to spend time with her, yeah. because Mario is attracted to the, you know, the macho boss, you know, character of Joe, he basically throws off and starts treating his girlfriend like shit. Yeah. Um, so he's not a hero. Like no. he, any early insinuation of his herodom, he's gone quite and soon. Later on, he deliberately runs over Joe. Yes, he does that on purpose. Um, so yeah, he he almost he doesn't become the villain, but he. It's not a hero. No, I don't think there's. I don't think there's a hero in this film as such. I think the closest you get really is it's Luigi and the German guy, and the German guy more so because he's Luigi feels sympathy, so you get with Luigi. Mm. But the German guy, there's quite a bit to his he's... story, which is very unusual for 1953. He's openly gay. Yeah. Um. He's and he also risks well, his own life. Well. Well. You say openly, it's never explicitly said. He so just he says doesn't... he doesn't like women. Now, that could actually mean he doesn't like anybody. Oh, so I suppose he could be asexual, that's um, true. He doesn't come out and literally say, I like to suck dick, <laughs> or anything no, like that. but I think it's heavily implied by a couple of things. I thought so, too. Uh, number one, the fact that this man is ripped in a way that would make us... Like, most people who were hot back in the day had a body that was very much of the era and wouldn't necessarily look quote unquote hot nowadays they don't have like the um ryan gosling six pack abs sort of thing this guy was quite close Mm. to a modern good looking look in terms of his physique um also when he gets later uh later on in the truck he's um shaving yeah and he's like he needs to look good no matter what they which are things that are stereotypical to be sure but they are stereotypes of... And he's always dressed well compared yeah. to most of the others. So there's a, there's a lot of similarity between how well-dressed someone is and their effeminate, male, like male but effeminate nature. And, the, yeah, the, this pristine gayness, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, which 
I'm not going to call out or I'm just going to state as that's what happens in the yeah. film. Because um, I'm not gay. I'm not going to make any statement on whether or not that's effective no. or not. But he, he is the closest they have to a hero because he is the one who acts the most selflessly yeah. um, during the sequence where the road is blocked by a boulder. He's the one who risks his life to, blow the to up. set up the mechanism of blowing up the boulder. Yeah. Um, yes, it's... He's also... He, we also get a bit of a sob story for him because... He's there's two Germans that are in there. One of them goes on the journey, which is the one we're talking about, and the other one doesn't. The one that goes on the journey also mentions that he was tortured and um, he was enslaved by the Nazis. Yeah. So he wasn't a Nazi sympathizer, and it's probably it may have been because of his homosexuality. It's never explicitly stated why, but he was working in salt mines for three years, and he said that's the reason that his hands are so steady in this scenario because he's been through all that shit. Yeah. So out of between him and Joe. He's actually hard as nuts, and Joe is not. Yeah. But Joe gives off the bigger facade. And the one bit that the training section actually does, though, which you could put elsewhere in the film, so it doesn't need to be the training section to substantiate it. But in the training section, um, someone's learning to trying to learn to drive the truck or prove that they can drive the truck, and they throw a. a once someone throws their jacket over the windscreen to fuck him up, so he gets oh, I thought thrown they th- out. I thought they threw it into the into wheel. the wheel, well, something like that. But basically, they screw up his chances. the The German guy we're talking about uh, is going next, and he just goes. By the way, if anyone throws anything at me or tries to screw me up, and basically threatens to kill them, yeah. but like so dead serious, you're like, yeah, all right, don't fuck with him. And I think that's why Joe doesn't go for him. When yeah. Joe picks his target of who he wants to get rid of, he doesn't want to get rid of Mario because clearly there's something there between them, both being Parisian, etc. He's got et him under his thumb. Yeah, he can't outdo um, Luigi yeah. because even though he can outdo him with a gun, that's not going to f- fly trying to get him on the road. Uh, he can't outdo the German guy because the German guy is actually strong. So the other German dude who gets the job Who's and an old doesn't man. turn up. Yeah, he's an old man, so he's easy pickings yeah. uh, compared to the other three. And I think that's quite important in the build-up of Joe's turn from hero to heel. Yeah. Even though he's not really a hero from the start, to be honest. He's always a villain. He's a stereotype of a villain, almost. Yeah. He looks like Wario. <laughs> the film tries to do, um, as we just read when we were reading about the critical reception of it, they pointed out the existential nature of it. And... I think that might be one of the reasons the film didn't really appeal to me as such, because I'm more a fan of... Uh, I I don't know how to explain this. I'm more a fan of films where the characters' actions deliberately cause their downfall. Right, so these people a, get fucked over by chance, rather yeah, than... Well, by, by the inevitability of the universe. Yeah. Um, I think that is why, it could just be that they were saving money, but I suspect that is why Luigi and... The German guy, what's his name? I okay. Name. I suspect that's why Luigi and the German guy die off screen. Yeah. Because to give them an actual death scene would undercut that and would be like, oh, this is a moment. Whereas I think what they're trying to get at is people die every day in all sorts of situations. And as far as the universe is concerned, or the planet even, mm. It's no big deal. You're just a flash in the pan and you're gone. And that's literally all they are. You yeah, literally yeah. just... Uh, Joe is There's looking a down... a of people, isn't there? Yeah. The Joe is just looking down at his cigarette. He's rolling a cigarette. You see a flash of light and the tobacco all blows out from the cigarette. And then you look up and you just see the smoke cloud. Mm. That's it. They're gone from the film. Yeah. After just, pr- just before that, having a big sequence where they were important. Yeah, yeah. Um... That's why I think having more of them in the trucks rather than so much at the beginning, building more of the characters so you care a lot more about the characters because yeah. you just started to care about them and then they're gone. Yeah. Um, having more time with them, talking a bit more about where they're from because we don't really know where Mario's from or where Luigi's from, sorry, why, how he got there either. It'd be nice to have a little bit of their backstory and not in the way that was done in Sorcerer. And again, I know we're going to cover Sorcerer separately, but Sorcerer basically, in order to try and fix the problem and i don't think it helps is essentially the intro to that is like 20 minutes of a vignette of each of the four drivers right and it's like this is what they were doing before and why they're on the island now and it's like tell me it in the truck yeah don't like there's a one of them in sorcerer is a um 
because it's set in, it's set in the seventies. It's twenty years later. Uh, he's a Cuban terrorist. Okay. Uh, so he bombs an emb- the American embassy, and then to escape, he has to go and fly away, and he ends up having to fly to this goddamn hellhole of a place, and then has to take the truck job. But the thing is, is you now know everything about the characters, but we're not getting any actual story development. Yeah. Whereas you could have told that story in the truck via a conversation, a bit of back and forth, two characters getting to know each other, and been more invested, um, which is what. And actually, that's that's re- other than the fact that I think it's always a bit of a cop out to do that. And even so, even much as I've stated before on the show, I love wild hogs. Even though it does establish each of the characters, I don't like that style of intro. Yeah, where it's just like this character, this character, yeah. this character, this character. Now go. It's one like, one way I've seen that done well with humorous effect, and I realise I'm not making myself seem any better because I'm naming trash films in when we're talking about Wages of Fear. There's a film called Feast, and Feast is a, a horror film all set in one location. It's literally a siege movie. Uh, people bar- locked in a bar in the desert, and there's monsters outside. It's that simple. As each character is introduced... They get an info card, right, and that could, like a graphic that comes up on the screen, and a little vignette that flashes back to them. Um, and what's hilarious? What I found hilarious was this low budget film did that, and it did it really well. And then years later, Suicide Squad copied it, and it's nowhere near as good. No. You know, that's a film that's got a multi million dollar budget. Anyway, can't pay for talent. One of the great things that Feast does is it almost it plays with your expectations because. Amongst the fact cards. So it'll be like their name, their age, occupation. And then it'll be their life expectancy, as in how far they're going to make it through the film. And there's a really good bit where a hero comes in, and he's literally called... Because none of them have normal names. Sure. Like Jamie, Rory. They're all called, like, old man, biker chick, things like that. Right, okay. Um... This this Bruce Campbell type character comes in, yeah. bars the doors. He's got a shotgun. He's like, "Okay, we're all gonna deal with this." Blah blah blah. Do exactly as I tell you, and you'll all be safe. His information comes up, and it's like, "Hero" is his name, and it's like life expectancy, looking good, or something like that. And as soon as the graphic comes down, the monster's arms break through the wall and drag him out and kill him. <laughs> and then you get Hero Two, and it and the fact is like, but I um, think it works better in a comedy than yeah. it does because. A comedy, you don't mind it being almost sketch-like. Yeah. But in a in a dramatic film... It doesn't work. No, because you, you, you don't watch a dramatic film for the sketches. No. That's, <laughs> so it no. doesn't really work the same way. Yeah. Though, weirdly enough, Wages of Fear does... Not <laughs> sketches, but it's almost like... Uh, you could imagine this... Uh, like the, the driving section, not the beginning and all that stuff, but the driving section, you could almost imagine as a series of relatively long short films yeah. by the same director. It very much feels like set piece to set piece. Yeah. And um, this is what you're saying, like, if you got rid of 90% of that beginning bit yeah, and worked it into conversations that they have in their downtime in the trucks, it would make the, the journey so would better. feel more like a journey yeah. as opposed to... We're at this bit now, we're at this bit now, we're yeah. at this bit It now. almost feels like they're running an obstacle course. Okay, yeah. first we're at the rocky road. Okay, now we're at the bridge. And there's now not we're much at the... downtime between those spaces. There's a no. little bit, but not much. No. Um, the existential thing gets carried on as the film goes on. So basically, uh, Joe, they, they, they come across an oil spill, yeah. which you handily informed me was an actual real, like they did that they intentionally, filled, yeah, they which f- fuck them for that. Actual crude oil. And the actors had to literally submerge themselves in crude oil. Yeah. They got conjunctivitis. They, they couldn't just dye some water black. No, because it, it, the way it sticks to the clothes and everything. Paint, um, black paint would have done I mean, the same they, yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, don't get, don't get me wrong. Uh, Star Trek Next Generation in its first season, there's a terrible episode, but it's the death of Tasha Yar, who was a main character until that episode. Um, there's a character called Artemis, I think the character's name is, and he's just a black goo monster. Right. Uh, but he lives in this pool of black oil, and he uses mystical powers to drag... Uh, the first season of Next Gen is garbage. Uh, uses mystical powers to drag Riker into the mud. This is pre-beard Riker as well, so no good. Uh, <laughs> drags him into the oil. 
And then, like, you see him come out and he's all covered in the... And it looks very similar to this. Mm. But they didn't use crude oil for that. Though apparently what they used was something really much better. Because it was a mixture of, like, different paints, different waters, and uh, black printer ink. And oh. stuff like that. So he was submerged in black printer ink and shit like that. Which gives a very similar effect to this. Yeah. Uh, but bear in mind that black printer ink in 1953 probably not as easy to get a hold of yeah. in mass quantities as just hey let's create an actual oil spill and bear in mind that we weren't that aware of the major environment. environmental issues so yeah. crude oil yeah just get a couple of gallons pour it in that hole mate there you go so they <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> they get there and they decide that they have to drive through this lake of oil at a decent speed if they slow down or stop that's it they'll be yeah. stranded well they can't get around it can they that's no. the only way through so you basically get this bit that I was interpreting as... So Joe's in front of the thing, trying to, like, almost clear the way. Yeah. And a big fallen tree comes up, and he's like, oh, no, no, I need to move this. But he can't move it, because he's weak. He gets trapped by it. And he gets trapped between that and the, the truck. And you you see Mario, and he... It's not like he wants to run him over. No. You kind of have that expression. So he's like... Well, there's no choice. I have to do this. Yeah. Um, and he ends up crushing Joe's leg. Joe's leg to the point where it's basically off. Yeah. Like yeah, it's, it's, it's dangling. That's really well done, actually. To be fair. Yes, because you don't have to see a lot to get the oh. effect. And the fact that this film's black and white, mm. there's there's something that makes the image pop and is very much more noirish in that sense when you see damaged mangledness yeah. in pure black and white bear in mind that the blackness of the crude oil versus the whiteness of the sand that's around them mixed in with this mangled leg yeah it's it's quite visceral yeah um and basically for the for the rest of the f- film for the rest of the time he survives joe is kind of in the cab of this truck leaning on mario and you get this whole existential, co- thinly veiled existential conversation about this street they both knew back in Paris and how there was this fence and he never knew what was beyond it. Yeah. And uh, oh, Mario says, says, oh, there's it. nothing behind it. And this is a v- very thinly veiled euphemism for there's no afterlife. Yeah, which is very interesting for 1953 as well because atheism wasn't really a big thing in 1953. I think in, in Europe it was, I think. Not as big. It's, I mean, don't get me wrong. I know that in the UK now we're majority atheist, so we're not majority. But in oh, 1953... Careful, you can't say that to certain people. Fuck them. But the... <laughs> I do not care. Look at the stats. The... But you've got to remember this was France and Italy. Certainly Italy in 1953. Mm. Italy very much... It includes Mr. Pope himself, yeah. um, and it was just after World War Two, really, yeah. uh, with Berlusconi, not Berlusconi. <laughs> <laughs> Mussolini. That was Bunga Bunga Party, Berlusconi. Yes. Uh, what? Do you not know about Berlusconi? I know Silvio Berlusconi, the corrupt Italian politician. Yeah, he was, he, but I don't know about Bunga Bunga. He, he actually I called thought he them was, Bunga thought... Bunga Parties, is where he would invite hot, sassy, big-breasted girls around and get loads of politicians to come and have a... Fun old time. Oh. And he called them Bunga Bunga parties. Okay, I, I knew he was corrupt. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, only a little. Well, oh, yeah, well, because I, <laughs> at uni, you know, I had a lecturer who was married to an Italian woman, mm. and we were talking to him about, and they spent all their summers in Italy, and we were talking to him about Berlusconi and why he kept getting elected, and this is his words, not mine. And this is talking back in 2010 to 2013. And he said... The thing you need to understand about Italian politicians is they're all corrupt. Berlusconi's just open about it. And mm. people kind of respect that. <laughs> yeah. I suppose it's... He doesn't pretend to be innocent. I think that was innocent. what got Trump in as well. Not that we're going to go too much into politics, but people felt, not necessarily that it was true, but people felt that he was a more honest, corrupt politician. Yeah, which was, of course... Garbage. garbage but it was as as proven by the fact he's now been indicted for the second time yeah. but on, people um, felt the same about boris yeah fuck so, boris. you know so like you know britain yeah. america there's no one doing it any better than the rest no, and he's just had to leave parliament hasn't he boris oh he's, yeah he's, he's not an mp anymore yeah well Woo. Good bad rubbish. anyway we're not meant to be political no unless it's about the film and there is no boris in this film no. so let's talk about politics in this film then because i actually didn't think it was that 
I didn't get as big an anti-American vibe as I thought I was gonna get. You've got to remember how sensitive they were very America sensitive was. back then because this is during the McCarthy era, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it funny? It's right wingers who are very oversensitive about people saying anything negative about America. Mm. You'll feel exactly the same about I Am Cuba, by the way, yeah. um, which was was outright banned. Uh, because well, that's because they had a very bad relationship with Cuba, didn't they? Well, so it was it was a Cuban film about Cuba, about how America treated Cuba, mm. funded and directed by Russia, and well, the Soviet Union <laughs> specifically yeah. during and the Cold War. During the Cold War, during the height of during the height of the Cold War, and uh, the <laughs> the thing is, America banned it because it was anti-American because mm. it made the Americans look bad, uh, but. The Russian or the Soviet Union government didn't like it and wouldn't give it much after it had come out. They didn't like it. Right. And most Soviet Union uh, Soviet Union members didn't like it because it wasn't negative about America enough. Right, it was actually quite fair. Like the Americans are shown to be dickheads, but it's through ignorance. Right, and it's very similar in this film. They know what they're doing is wrong, but it's mostly ignorance helps them get by. Mm. Uh, but for some reason, showing that uh, most American people who aren't the ones making the main decisions are yeah. ignorant of the power dynamic was too anti-American. Yeah, and there's a lot of films that got cut down. This got cut to pieces by America, and I'm Cuba got cut completely uh, because America just like right wingers in America just couldn't take. You know, guys, maybe just give it a bit more thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's true. And that happened again with John Wayne. Yeah. Uh, trying to shut down any left-leaning films. You know, we're at a point at the moment where it's said to be the left wing is shutting a lot of stuff down. And that does happen. You yeah. know, I'm not I'm, I'm being completely apolitical on that. That does happen. But let's not pretend it's one side or the other. This oh, happens yeah. on both angles. During this time, it was very much the right wingers. Didn't yeah, it? people. But... Tr- I have a problem with anyone, no matter what side you're on. I have a problem with anyone who tries to say we shouldn't be able to have art about a certain topic. Sure. Like, I'm sorry, piss off. Yeah. Art is how we explore different topics. Whether those topics are worth exploring or not. Mm. That is for the viewer to decide, it is also not often, for a governing yeah. body to yeah. assume they have the moral authority over everyone else. Yeah, I mean, the the other thing as well is it's often, and I say often, not always, a safe way to look into those subjects. Where, as like for example, just hosting a, hosting a debate, if we would say we're in the UK, let's talk about Labour versus Conservatism. No matter which way that conversation goes, someone's getting angry because you're talking about something that's present. Mm. You're talking about how people feel politically now, mm. about the people they may or may not vote for, who they may or may not like. Mm. Uh, how And if you go, right, the Tories are like this or the Labour people are like this or the, the Greens are like this, someone's taking personal offence to that. Doing it in art, the way that, say, 1984 does and things like that, it gives you a slight safe distance. And that's why sci-fi did it so well as well. It gives you a safe enough distance that you're not... I'm not talking about the Tories. I'm talking about these guys over here, this fake, made-up mm. alien nation. Or I'm talking about this lot, who are more like the Greens, and that, that made-up fake alien mm. nation. Or And in this case, not aliens, but, you know, it, it gives that safe enough distance that you can discuss the subject without necessarily offending anyone. Yeah. Um... And shutting any of that down can be dangerous. The only one of the main caveats in film with that though would be uh, Birth of a Nation because it literally respawned the long dead KKK. Right. Um, so there, there, there does have to be some understanding of what your art can do. Uh, or, may, on... or maybe people just need to not be fucking idiots. But yeah. then, then again, as uh, as Joe Bob Briggs once famously said, um, that is the attitude everyone has when when there was the big discussion in the eighties about banning horror movies and does violence in films create violence in reality? And video games, video games um, through that as well. As, as he said, the thing is, everyone has a superior attitude to it. No one's ever talking about the violence influencing them. They're always sitting at home going, "Violence in movies is not going to affect me. It's going to affect all those." other people yeah those far too smart skanky people yeah. who don't know how to watch a movie yeah. we know but they don't yeah yeah 
it's it's stupid people having stupid attitudes sure. where they think they're superior to other people. Um, so what do there you was think a great line in this about... film. Oh, sorry. There was a great line in this film that I liked because it's true. Um, and you can prove this if you look at some of the really high paid, uh, high paying jobs in the world now, like, for example, uh, people who are deep sea oil drilling specialists, um, the ones who literally have to live in a diving bell for months at a time. Um, they get paid a fortune. It's one of the highest paying jobs in the world. And there's a line quite near the beginning where uh, Joe says, they're not paying us for our labor. They're paying us to be terrified. Yeah. Um, and I liked that because that's true. Uh, yeah. That is why that deep sea oil drilling thing is because it can go wrong. And when it goes wrong, you die. Yep. Um, the, the, and it the can very, go wrong a million ways. Ma- As the very says, infamous... I've died 50 times over the last night. Yeah. The very infamous Byford Dolphin incident from the 90s, I think Byford Dolphin was. That was a deep sea oil drilling platform, partly owned by us and partly owned by, I want to say, Norway in the North Sea. Um, And they had one of these specialized teams who were drilling for oil deep down. And they had to live in a diving bell, which is obviously like a fake environment that is kept at below sea pressure yeah. because basically it's not cost efficient to send someone down there and then bring them up within one shift yeah. because you have to come up slowly because of the bends don't you yeah yeah yeah. basically it changes basically yeah. they'd get half an hour of work done and have to start coming back up again so they get paid millions to live in deep sea pressure for like four months at a time Anyway, there was a famous incident, or infamous, should I say, incident at Byford Dolphin, where for some reason, I don't know why, the diving bell depressurized, and they all exploded. Who cleaned it? I mean, (laughs) BP oil, I think. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm saying is, they're not wrong. People are paid to give up their lives. When you you do, um, when you, to be honest, any job you're technically being paid to give up your life because we all have a finite amount of time and the deal that you make unless you're you know born rich the deal we make for example is that in exchange for money we will give up seven hours let's say per day of our lives it's 10 for me because i do long days don't i but we will give up that many hours of our life each week well per day well, we're contracted to so many hours a week, yeah, yeah, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I get your point. Um, and it's really sad when you think about it that way. When you're in a more physical job, like, say, my dad was as a coal miner, mm. you're not only being paid to give up that immediate time, but you're giving up your future time as well because the chances are when you're in a physical labour job... You're wearing yourself out. You're away. wearing yourself out. Your risk of being in an on-site accident is much worse is much higher. Um, you know, it reminds me of... Uh, have you seen the miniseries Chernobyl? No. It's good. Yeah, I've heard um, things about it. There's a bit in that, and apparently this is true, this did happen apparently, there's a bit in that where the Soviet government realise that... Because um, they lock down, the, the reactor explodes, they lock it down, they just literally put a massive concrete roof on top of it. Right. And they're like, okay, cool. That'll stay there for a little while. The inside, the reaction is still going. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they realize that the reaction is so hot, the core, that it's actually melting through the floor of the facility. Yeah. And it's going to reach the water table. That actually happened in real life. Yeah. And if it reaches the water table, it will irradiate the water supply and everyone's going to, you know, die. die. So they get this team of miners because they they come up with a plan, which is they're going to like dig a tunnel to divert the fluid or something like the point is a tunnel needs digging who do you get to dig tunnels miners and they literally turn around to these miners it's a horrible way to use these children in it these weren't children <laughs> but they literally turn around to these miners and they're like uh basically we need you to go dig this big hole and you will all die yeah yeah um, that actually happened so in in the show i don't know if this did happen in reality in the show they all start digging it naked because it's a it's hundreds of degrees down there. Yeah. So they're just like, fuck it, we're dying anyway. So they're all just, just all these miners with like their tallywhackers out, just right. <laughs> mining. <laughs> but yes, you are in the, in the capitalist society that we've created, you are paid to give up time from your life. Yes. Unless you are one of the very fortunate few who sits at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. 
you are giving up your life yeah, in exchange for cash. So let's talk about the ending of this film. Uh, the garbage ending. Yeah, uh, I, I actually don't like the ending. Um, um, it's a completely different... His character completely changes. Yeah, and it also doesn't match up with what's said earlier. Yeah. Which is I like the, him collapsing. That bit was good. Yeah, yeah. So all that bit. So he he um, Joe dies lying against him. He drives in. All the guys, all the Americans come running up. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe you made it. Where where's the other where are the other three? They didn't make it. Mm. They see Joe's body in the cab, and they all like take off their hats in honor of him. Um, he tells them that he was brave, even yeah. though he wasn't. Uh, and then he goes sees the fire and he just collapses. And when they come over to see if he's alright, it's just oh he's sleeping. Yeah, he needs a fucking kip. Yeah. After three hundred miles of that, yeah. um, was that time. was all perfect. Yeah. Then it jumps and it's the middle of the day. Obviously, next day he's wearing new clothes obviously given to him by the americans and it's a, a lot more upbeat it's like well, no that's okay i'll take the truck now okay do you want our um chauffeur to drive you not chauffeur that's another word escort to drive you back and he's like no no i won't feel comfortable unless i'm driving myself right which i'm fine with the line um so the the escort gets out and he's going to drive the because he has to drive the truck back um and then the next bit we see is his girlfriend celebrating that he's coming back dancing with all the locals and you know they're having a right old time because they're yeah. they're celebrating that he's survived and that he's on his way back um and then he's also celebrating so he, as they're dancing he's almost dancing with the truck yes. weaving swerving. it from side to side, side, side on like a very idiot. thin mountain road yeah and then eventually he crashes through the wall now what was interesting is she went oh he's uh, when you saw her come back you're like oh god it's gonna be that traditional hollywood ending he's got yeah it. i, I forgot that it wasn't a hollywood film and then yeah and then I saw... <laughs> all the americans because it's all subtitled and then all of a sudden it's americans so i went oh it's a hollywood film yeah, yeah. Uh, but he doesn't make it. He crashes off the side of the road mm. from driving like an idiot and dies after being, you know, the truck crushes and destroys and blows up. Um, and that's and that just comes up with Finn. Uh, yeah, now, now what you could have done there... Yeah. Uh, so there's two ways of interpreting that. One is just that he's su- suddenly super carefree and relieved and that makes him be stupid, mm. uh, which is clearly the way the film intends it. Yeah, the other way... For me, though. No, it doesn't. It's garbage. It doesn't fit with his character or what he's been through. No. What it could have been, but it is not played this way, so I do not believe that it's this thing, is that he is so traumatised by this existential nightmare he's gone through that he deliberately da- drives dangerously in the hope he will die. Yeah, it's definitely not played that way. But he isn't He's played that way. too much. At, it's too well, much it's not even it. that. It's the fact that he seems surprised when he goes over the edge. Yeah, yeah. So that they, it completely ruins that read of it, which is mm. a shame because that may have worked a little better. The way I would have done the ending, now obviously this is 60 years of hindsight, but the way I would have done the ending instead is I would have had him get back to his girlfriend but not do the Hollywood ending yeah. of like, oh, and he's back and we're going to live together happily ever after. Earlier on in the film, before they, while they, when the drivers are all there and they tell, and the American guy tells them what the job is, one of them, who's a Texan guy, turns it down. Yeah, turns it down and goes, screw this, I'm out. And they're like, what? And he's like, no, it's $2,000, which seems the way they're talking about it is like they're millionaires. Um, it's $2,000, what are you talking about? It's like, no, I, no, he's like, no, I, I saw people do this in Texas when I grew up. And afterwards, they'd come back. They'd ha- well, have shaking, they'd probably gray have the hair. Shakes, they'd, they'd have aged like 30 years in like a week. And they'd be pale. Their fingernails would be white. You know, they'd be screwed. That would have been the way I'd have him. He'd he he'd, he'd they give him the cab and they go, oh, "Do you want our escort to drive back?" No, I wouldn't. Instead of playing his that, no, I wouldn't trust it if it wasn't me. He'd be like, no, I can't trust anyone else at that wheel. And he'd drive back fucking ten and two like a perfect driver, mm. like he's just passed his driving test. And then and he makes it back. They're all celebrating like, "Oh, he's back!" And they're all upbeat. And it's like, "Yeah, you made it! I can't believe it! Hooray for Mario!" And he's just. His hair's gone, gone grey, he's like sunken in his eyes, and he's just, he can't, and he's got the PTSD, he's got the shakes, he can't hold a glass of drink, mm-hmm. his hand is just shaking. That terror, I think that would have been the more poignant ending, yeah, because he became exactly what was described earlier in the film. Um, and she lost him anyway. So she gets him I mean, back he, physically, but he's not really there. He clearly didn't love her anyway. At the beginning, she tries to stop him leaving, and she climbs on the side of his moving truck, and he literally opens, opens the, the door, door to knock her off. <laughs> yes, but 
that gives her because for some reason she's still infatuated with him. Our oh, young love, uh, but must have thing- a big old dick. <laughs> <laughs> Mario, wahoo! But <laughs> anyway, um, I would it would have given her arc a finish as well because yeah. she would have seen him come back and realised she's lost him anyway. Um, yeah. And whether or not she ever had him is beyond the point. He's not there now. Yeah. The man that she fell in love with is gone. He's dead, yeah. metaphorically. He, he psychologically is He's dead. He's dead inside. Um, so th- that's what I meant by this film. I love this film. I think it's a brilliant film. I think for when it was made, it was exceptional. Um, and I love the way it builds tension. I love the story because I love a good road movie. Um, and yeah, everything about it is great. But it's not perfect. The intro's too long. The outro makes no sense. And I would expand Act 2 with that information from Act 1. Shorten Act 1. And Act 3 I would extend slightly and make it more hard-hitting and poignant. Yeah. Um, what about yourself? Um, yeah, I can mostly agree with that. I think I think you, know, you have to take age into account. The film has aged. Um we're going to do Sorcerer at some point, and we'll see if 30 years or so uh, yeah, improved it. Um, um, what what I will say this for Sorcerer. Um, if you're worried about this, then don't be. Uh, Sorcerer, the dangers... Obviously, it has a similar thing where they go through multiple different dangers, two trucks, two drivers per truck. But all the dangers are different. Right. So you won't be watching it and going back over the rocky road or having the triggery is bridge there, is or it the. Be an Autobot and a Decepticon. Unfortunately, not because God it's still it. about ten years before they were invented. How come, how come none of these? How come none of these trucks can turn into giant killer robots? Maybe they can, but it's just in the subtext, Jamie. I am Optimus Prime. <laughs> Optimus. Prime. I I will get your nitroglycerin away from the Decepticon. <laughs> I have to the wa- the, the Wages of Fear, directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> Starring Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> Who would you have, if someone was to do a modern remake of this, that you think would work? Who okay. do you reckon has the, the... Who would you immediately go to and that's the director? To direct and star in it. Direct mostly, but you could choose stars as well, yeah, I suppose. Um, let's go for... Let's go for David Fincher directing it. Oh, that's a good choice. He's very good at suspense. Yeah. Um, you can't have the cast you've got now because of the whole uh, diversity angle. So at least one of them's got to be a woman. Let's get Edward Norton in there just because I absolutely love Edward Norton as an Who actor. Who would you have him as? I'd have him as the main guy, Mario. Mario. Yeah, I think he'd be yeah. a good Mario. Um, Edward Norton's great. Um, let's make, let's be honest, it's got to be the hero character on it. So let's turn the German guy into a girl. Okay. Um, Charlie Theron? Charlie Theron would work. She's a great actress. I'm partial to Kate Beckinsale myself. I really Kate like Beckinsale's Kate Beckinsale. Also good choice, yeah. Um, because you want them all to sort of be in their 40s or 50s, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kate Beckinsale. Oh, I tell you, it'd be a good Joe. Ben yeah. Kingsley. Yeah, yes. I know he's a little old. Yeah, but, but that's the point of the character, so that actually yeah. would work quite well for him. Yeah, it. Ben he, Kingsley's your job. He's a very good actor, so yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd smash it. Uh, There's uh, So who would we get for Luigi? Luigi. And don't say the guy from... So he's uh, quite a cheerful, happy type character, isn't he? Chris Pratt would do an all right job, no. but he's not Italian, and we've given him enough Italian characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's... See, I would have gone with Bob Hoskins, but he's no longer with us. No. And he's also, he would have been too old, even if he was still alive. Um, Do you know what? Oh, no, because he's dead as well. Batista. <laughs> yeah. Batista could just lift that rock and yeah. throw it. <laughs> um, the Undertaker comes down to try and punch the trucks. Yeah. And Batista has to wrestle Louis. him. So he'd probably be about the right age. You know what else would be good in this film? Instead, if you didn't want to go with Edward Norton, your backup option would be Carl Urban. Carl Urban would be good in this. Yeah. I like Carl Urban. There, to be honest, it could be flipping Carrie and I'd put Carl Urban in the lead and it would be fine. Yeah. Because <laughs> Carl Urban's good. I would well, love to see Carl Urban as Carrie. They've just <laughs> cast Carl Urban in Mortal Kombat 2, haven't they? Have they? He's Johnny Cage. Carl oh, Urban is... You know, know what? It, it doesn't fit in my doesn't head. doesn't fit to me. But I trust him. Yeah. Carl Urban is one of those people where, like, when he was cast as Dr. McCoy, I was like, no, fuck that, that won't work. It worked. Uh, when he was yeah. like, he's going to be 
dread. I was like, it might be all right if he can be macho enough. Yeah. He was more than macho. God, <laughs> goddamn scumbag. That man is a chameleon. He's one of those people where you're like, oh, you like Carl Urban? Oh, did you like him in Chronicles of Riddick? Sorry, he was in Chronicles of Riddick? Yeah, what about in Lord of the Rings? He was in Lord of the Rings? Mm. He's just like, somehow he's got a distinctive look, but he's also a chameleon. Yeah, he can do <laughs> How the hell things. does he do that? He's a brilliant actor, so, you know. How, like, how about you? Who would you have to direct this? You know what? David Fincher was a very good shout. It would have been very close to my choice, I think, because, again, it's finding someone who can build tension. And unfortunately, yeah. a lot of modern cinema doesn't Can't. really do tension yeah. as such. Yeah. So I'd probably stick with David Fincher. Um, if I if it was to be like the way that I would want to rewrite it, having a lot more dialogue between the two people in the trucks, I know it's cliche, very cliche for nowadays, uh, because he's in literally everything and your mum's film. Chris Pratt. No, no, uh, Ryan Reynolds. Oh, Ryan Reynolds. I would put him as the German guy. The only problem with Ryan Reynolds is he ever since 2016 he stopped acting. Yeah, no. And now but, he's just dead poor. Yeah, but if if you need to put some personality in them trucks, he's the right man for and it. And he owns Wrexham AFC now, so he's busy with that. He's busy being a football manager. But I watched The Proposal yesterday and I really enjoyed it again, so... Yeah? I, yeah, I, I yeah want... but that, that's because that's before he stopped acting. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I want 2009 Ryan Reynolds. I, I really... En- I quite like it. It's not a good film, but he's good in it. He's in the Amityville Horror remake oh, okay. from 2005. And he's acting. He's not dead poor. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan Reynolds is an amazing actor. When I just, he acts. He, yeah, he just, I just wish he would got, start acting again. He's gotten locked in the Deadpool st- format, I think, which I understand why because it, it's what basically he was always always big, but Deadpool rose him from like big to sort of triple A league. Yeah, um, and so I can understand why it's a shtick he's doing a lot more of in other films. But I would love to see him do something that's very different. Yeah, um, you know, like he did. He, there's a horror film with him in what's it called? Voices. Yes. I really want to see that. I've never he seen was, it. He's so good in it as it's well. It's a horror comedy, isn't it? Yeah, but it's mostly horror, weirdly enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, he plays a psychotic man really well. Um, but yeah, let, let, we, I think we've... Is there anything more you want to say about Wages of Fear? No, I think I've summed it up. How do we get the rights so we can remake it? Uh, you have to find out who the right holders are. Give it to me. <laughs> uh, which is quite complicated, given that it's had remakes, it's based on a book, etc., etc. Yeah. You'd yeah. probably have to option the book rights again, because I, yeah. I bet the option has expired and then by you'd have now. To, if you wanted to use the name again, you'd probably have to option the name. Um, I have to say, Wages of Fear is a way better name for the movie than Sorcerer. Yeah, yeah, Sorcerer's a garbage name. Um, but you could probably... You know, you could probably get away with the concept very similar to this, yeah, with a different title and not get sued. So long as you um, change the dangers and stuff, you probably would get away. Yeah, with it. change it. From, like, what they're going to sue? Oh, you put people in trucks on a movie. Yeah, All right. Change it from nitroglycerin to something else. Yeah, that's easily Get-like flammable or, or explodable. Yeah, unobtainium. <laughs> unobtainium. <laughs> Glycerin exists. I didn't just make a thing up. We, we need you know something glig- that the human race are after, <laughs> and it's got to be really rare, and they can't get it anywhere else. You know, so, something unobtainable. <laughs> what would we call that? Do you know what uh, Glycerin is? Galignite. Yeah. That's not the one. No, that's not. Um, I was going to say it's not the one that's. There's a really w- weird metal mm. that is liquid at body temperature. Right. So if if you hold it in your hand, it melts and becomes liquid metal. Oh, mercury. No, no, no. It's not mercury. It's some other kind of metal. And as you pour it, it solidifies. Wow. And then melts again on your hand. That's so cool. It's like, hold, it's like holding a piece of the T-1000. That's awesome. I'd love to know what that is because yeah. I love that sort of thing. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but yeah, Gelignite is a, uh, it's basically a bomb made of jelly, like gelatin. Oh, it's a gelatin bomb. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so and the IRA used to use a lot of them, but it's it was invented at the same time as dynamite, and it's more stable. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, because of Acme, everyone thinks of the big dynamite sticks. But it was just the they usually use gelignite because it was a lot easier to get and safer to use. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today as we take a look at the wages of fear. Um, I think we've been quite fair to it. I think we've had quite a good discussion. Uh, so. That is a wrap on Wages of Fear, and we will see you next time for another second take.